everybody and welcome. My name is Anna Button. I work for Hagar New Zealand and it is my great honour today to be facilitating Hagar's first global webinar, Connecting Our Hagar Global Community. Um, I am joined by three of Hagar's general executive team today. Um, I have my colleague, colleague Trina Sam, who is calling in from Cambodia, where she is the acting executive director. I have my colleague Carol Mortensen, who's calling in from Vietnam, um, where she is the executive director. And I have Andrew Catford on the line as well, who is the international CEO for Hagar. Uh, just to, to acknowledge that we know that on all of the promotion op material for this webinar, um, we did advertise that Christiana, the executive director for Hagar Afghanistan, was going to be joining as well. Unfortunately, she is now unable to make it, but she has kindly passed on some notes to Andrew, uh, who will be um, passing on that information to you so our Afghanistan community and family is still represented and heard as well. Uh, so the reason that we're on this platform today and doing this webinar is because it is important to the three leaders on this call and to us as an organization that we connect with all of you, our wonderful supporters at this time. Um, and that you get the opportunity to hear straight from the field about how our work is going. Uh, when you give um, a donation to a support office around the world, whether that be in New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, the US, England, when you give money to a support office, um, that money comes to a support office to, to the work that these guys are going to be describing this afternoon. And with the values of being transparent um, and honest and full of integrity, we want to connect and make sure that you guys feel connected with our work at this time. So before we launch in, I am going to do a few housekeeping rules um, and then we will get stuck into it. So the format for today's webinar is that I'm going to ask our wonderful panelists a series of questions uh, for about 40 minutes. And at the conclusion of 40 minutes, uh, we will then provide you, our wonderful supporters, with the opportunity to ask these three leaders about their work in their different contexts. Uh, to ask a question, uh, you should see at the bottom of your screen right now uh, a Q&A button. And so if you want to ask a question, uh, please click that button and send that question through to us. Uh, we will, uh, the chances are very um, unlikely that we'll be able to answer everyone's questions. We'll only have time for a select few today. But um, if you write that question and we don't get to you, we will make a note of it in the respective country where you are, I will contact you directly with the answer. So it is absolutely still worth putting those questions in the field. The chat component of um, your menu at the bottom of your screen is very much just for you guys to communicate with each other as you're listening to us, to make comments, to send feedback through. Uh, but if you want a question, the Q&A button is the place to do that. Um, we also are recording today's session uh, so that those supporters who uh, aren't able to join us uh, can still um, be able to join in and hear this content going forward. So we are recording, so please take note of that. And at the end of the webinar, we will be sending you um, a very quick five question survey uh, that we would really appreciate you filling out, just so that we can know uh, if we do this again, what kind of topics you as our supporters would be interested in hearing about more in the future. So please fill that out when you send it. Um, so to kick off today, uh, we thought it would be worth uh, just returning to Hagar's mission to start. Uh, why it is that we do the work that we do and the impact that we're having. And so I'm going to send the first question to our CEO, Andrew Catford. Uh, and that question is, Andrew, what are the global issues that Hagar um, exists um, and seeks to try and help solve? Thanks, Anna. Uh, Hagar's vision is to see our clients free and healed from the trauma of human trafficking, modern slavery and abuse. Uh, there's currently 40.3 million people in modern day slavery in the world. That's the highest in history, more than ancient Egypt, the transatlantic slave trade. And it's due to a whole lot of complex reasons, globalization, commercialization of labor, uh, often linked uh, to cheap supply chain labor. Um, we've also, through the work of Hagar, seen very strong links uh, between these issues and poverty, uh, and also countries coming out of conflict. So these are really uh, things that affect the most vulnerable, people who are very vulnerable and desperate. 
Uh, also in terms of uh, trafficking, um, we, we understand trafficking as, as a part of slavery, uh, partic particularly people who are trafficked both across national borders, but also internally within their own countries. Uh, also, out of that group of 40.3 uh, million people, there's about 10 million children. So children are particularly susceptible to this. Uh, and also a large group is, is women. So Hagar's focus is, has really ended up being uh, very much on children and women. Uh, also in terms of geography, about 62% of people are in Asia who experience uh, modern day slavery. Um, so again, that's led to the focus of, of Hagar on Asia. Uh, another common theme we see in, in uh, trafficking and modern day slavery is abuse or gender-based violence. So that's also become a strong focus for Hagar. Uh, many of the countries we work in have rates of gender-based violence of 60% or higher of women experiencing this. Um, so these are complex uh, problems uh, and they also need responses at different levels. Uh, Hagar over the last 26 years has become a leader, particularly in helping survivors heal and recover from the trauma uh, associated with these things. So we've worked directly with 19,000 caseworker clients and also under, uh, addressing the underpinning issues that cause these things. So basically our business is transforming lives of some of the world's most vulnerable women and children and freeing them from this trauma. So we're currently working with 35,000 people in 2020 and we are really determined, Anna, to continue this despite the effects of COVID-19. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And so uh, I love I love the transforming lives. That's what Hagar's core business is, to transform the lives of some of the most traumatized people on the planet. And so Andrew has said uh, that we are absolutely experts at this. And when I um, give presentations at groups, I always say, you know, those issues of 40.3 million people in slavery and 62% of them being in Asia, those such big issues and they require organizations to do um, whatever they are experts in uh, to be able to combat that. And so we are experts at the recovery um, and at helping individuals overcome their trauma. And so when our partners and our government departments uh, find and rescue and um, receive referrals from women who have severed, um, have experienced the abuses that Andrew has outlined, um, they refer them to Hagar. And so, Shreina, I'm going to pass over to you um, to describe uh, briefly for our, for our supporters what it is that we do with those traumatised individuals who have experienced those traumas um, once we receive, receive those referrals. Thank you, Anna, uh, for your uh, good question. And that's really, uh, really always uh, um, my privilege to talk about uh, Hagar what we are doing in Hega. So Hega's work is we are uh, working alongside the survivors uh, who are suffer from the trauma, you know, resulting from uh, trafficking, slavery and abuse. So uh, the different experts um, services that we provide um, responding to trauma-informed care and uh, from the identification of need for protection that they have no hope or dreams. So through the whole journey the, of the services as uh, to have them being able to stand, restore, resilient and confident to live independently in their own community of chosen. So in our casework that you see in the, um, in the screen, in our casework, case managers is assigned uh, to work individually with the survivors, with the client and families. And safety is always become the first priority in our initial intake assessment. So we ensure the survivor live uh, in a safe accommodation, either in their original family, kinship care, uh, foster care or shelter. Currently we have about like 600 uh, clients are living safe in the uh, different type of care, depend on their need of their safety. So physical health is important um, to care for the first, uh, for the first intake. So some client may need intensive treatment in the hospital um, uh, due to the severe abuse. So Hega case manager working with the hospital and community health center uh, for the client and family are able to access the health services when they need. And counselor um, are assigned to work individually with the client. Uh, building trust, resilience, um, trauma healing is not one day of work. So healing is 
the process and it's taking time. So until the client can cope well with their trauma and stand by themselves. And justice is very important for our trauma recovery to have the survivor feel safe and dignity as human being. And so our lawyer is working really closely with the case managers and counselors, clients, family, as well as NGO partners, local authorities to reinforce the progress of um, court procedure. So currently uh, in Haga, Cambodia and Vietnam, uh, we have about like 56 clients um, are in the court process. And so all staff in Haga um, uh, are being trained about client and child protection policy to help the survivor in this uh, process. And majority of the client that we serve um, are children. So um, children often have a dream. Everyone have a dream. So the children that we work with, many of them, they are not to think that um, about their dream because um, they don't ever thought that uh, they will become the true compared to the, the life that they are living right now. So Hega case manager working uh, closely with the family, local authority, school principal in their local school to ensure that the client are in school and have the material that they need for their education. So education uh, help them to build their dreams and also achieve their dream. So we have um, client are currently studying in the primary school, client are studying in the secondary school, also client are studying at the universities. And economic empowerment um, team build connection with business partner, NGO, uh, private sector to provide skill, training and employment to our survivors, client and their families. This is for the sustainability of their living. So economic empowerment you know, um, income and able to um, care for their children. And this is um, one of the part of the preventions um, of migration as well because uh, every day, thousands of Cambodian people, thousands of people are migrate uh, towards other country, and which is high risk for um, trafficking. So, family is the most important to keep uh, um, protection system of the survivors, and being employed or having uh, enough income or good income uh, through their own business building a sustainability for the futures of uh, independence. And so some of our clients that um, uh, achieve the dream and graduate from uh, our program, they are willing to come back and um, uh, re uh, to give back what they have received from Hagar and they want to um, give back to other uh, people. So some of them are working as a social workers, counselors, doctors, nurses, um, photographers, cook, caregiver, teller, yeah. So, um, but they're willing to advocate um, or help other people um, who need help. Yeah. And so those who are- I'll just pause you, Shana, because I think you just- And um, yeah, they are- I think we're having some technological difficulties, and which is um, totally understandable given where Shana is in the world and the lack of um, good Wi-Fi accessibility. Uh, so I'll just summarize, uh, summarize those final points that you may or may not have heard, but Shana is talking about how our goal for every single individual that we work with is to see them achieve and realize their dreams. And, uh, and a lot of people, they, uh, certainly in New Zealand, they ask us, oh, you know, are you just a, a Band-Aid organization at the bottom of the cliff once, once, the, um, you know, once the trauma has already happened? But the reality is, is that we seek to raise up leaders, that we meet people when they have absolutely no hope, no dreams and are traumatized, and we do that long-term holistic healing that, that Shreya has just described. And the result of that is that we have social workers and doctors and people in wonderful professions in their communities who are serving and leading, uh, which is what we want to see and what the result is. And so um, just to give an example of um, that holistic whole journey that Shreya has described, um, I'm going to pass over to Carol and Carol's just going to say um, one story, just one of the thousands um, of uh, someone who has has experienced this whole journey and received our services and what it's meant for their life. So Carol, to you. 
Thank you very much, Anna. Um, it, is, it is true that there are many inspiring stories about clients across all of the countries where we implement the whole journey. So that's across Afghanistan, Cambodia, Singapore, Vietnam. The story that I'm going to talk about today is a young woman who has been a client with Hagar in Vietnam for about five years. She grew up in central Vietnam. She's from a rural province and community from the Kotu group, which is one of Vietnam's 54 ethnic groups. Her parents were divorced. She was living with her father's family. And so she was very, um, she didn't have a strong relationship with her mother. When she was 16 years old and still attending secondary school, she was tricked by some Vietnamese traffickers and taken to China. During the next two years that Tian lived in China, she experienced extreme abuse. She was forced to be a wife to three different Chinese men. She didn't speak the language. She didn't know how she would ever get home. And she had a very, very hard life. But Tian is one of the lucky ones. Somehow, she escaped. She found her way to the Vietnam border and was repatriated to her own community. Now, Tian had always been a good student and she dreamed of returning to school. But her family, when she returned after those two years, was too economically poor to allow that. So she had to work in her uncle's coffee shop. She thought that everything would be all right. She was home. But unfortunately for her, her friends and her neighbors, they didn't treat her in the same way that she had been treated before she went to China. They started to avoid her, they looked down on her, and, and they talked a lot behind her back. She was very frightened, she lost all of her confidence, and she tried to commit suicide several times. Tian was referred to Hagar by the local authorities, and she became a client through our whole journey project. She wanted to come to Hanoi. For the next five years, Hagar has supported her to live for two years in our shelter. We have also spent three years providing rent assistance for her to live independently in the community. We helped her get a small job to support her. She received health care and individual counselling and mentoring, some life skills development. And when we came to talking about what kind of career she wanted, she told us what her dream was. She said she now had the confidence to return to secondary school, to finish her studies, and she really wanted to go to university. This was her dream. When she returned to school, she was in the eighth grade, but much older than many of her peers. She worked hard. She received certificates each year for being an excellent student. And in 2019, she was granted a scholarship and to attend the University of Social Work in Hanoi. Today, Tian is completing her first year of study and is one of the top students in her course. Her dream, which is the dream of so many of Hagar clients, is how can she give back? Tian wants to be a social worker with Hagar. But Tian is not just a leader amongst her peer group in Hanoi. She was nominated by Hagar last year to become a youth representative of Vietnam in an international conference in Taiwan and was the selected candidate. She told her story to organizations, to the newspapers, to television interviews. She told her story about why it was important for policymakers to prevent and respond effectively. Tian. I am inspired by a woman who had very little hope. Her dreams were crushed and she is now making that life for herself just as she wants. And, so, and that's the Hagar difference, isn't it, Carol? That you say that we first met her when she was suicidal and had attempted suicide, but now because of the impact of Hagar um, and Hagar's provision of services, she is now healed and thriving um, and a leader in her community. And that is the Hagar difference. And that is our mission in a nutshell. Shell of, of us seeking to transform lives now care at the moment. Uh, but obviously in our world at the moment, we have something else going on called COVID-19. 
And so um, while Hagar's mission of transforming more lives like TM um, is still very much the same, the way that we deliver those services that Shreina has described, the way that we help people like TM has had to temporarily change. And so just changing tack a little bit now, um, colleagues of mine, um, Shreina, I might start with you. Uh, can you um, describe uh, what COVID looks like in Cambodia at the moment and what it is meaning for your clients? And then I'll uh, move on to you, Carol. Thank you, Anna. So uh, currently there are 122 cases confirmed. Even though um, Cambodia has um, uh, less uh, uh, cases uh, compared to other countries, but we uh, actually we don't have a good system, health system, health system here, and also um, a very limit, uh, limited uh, capacity um, of the doctors and nurses. So our government has been uh, closed all the school entire Cambodia, and also um, uh, group meetings or um, uh, training, and also uh, religious gathering are, are restricted. And so many businesses are closed, and also organizations. And um, the, uh, uh, about 200 uh, uh, garment factory has been uh, uh, bankrupt and closed as well. So that really uh, affect to the, uh, many people's lives. Uh, also, especially for our clients that we work with, that they lost their job, they don't have enough income, they cannot earn from their small business. So that uh, really hard for their livings and also. Um, uh, with uh, this stressful situation and make them more stressful and depression. So, um, yeah, this is uh, the situation that we, we have seen right now. Mm. And Carol, to you in Cambodia, what's COVID looking like in your context? Uh, well, in Vietnam, we have a social structure uh, where the government um, brought in very strong measures very early on. So amongst 96 million people living in Vietnam, we've We've got 268 confirmed cases, 214 recoveries, and no deaths. We have a very um, established uh, system where if you are corona positive, you go into the centre for disease control for two weeks and on until you are cured. If you are suspected of having COVID-19, then you go into a quarantine center established um, in the major centers of Vietnam. And if you come from a commune where migrant workers from China, for example, um, one of them tests positive, the whole commune is locked down. So at the moment, we're like many places globally, we're practicing social distancing. Um, Hanoi has the most number of positive cases. So we have 112 confirmed cases. Um, even though the land borders were closed with China on the 1st of February and subsequently quite quickly with Laos and later with Cambodia, uh, domestic and international travel has, has almost ceased. Um, and we've been practicing social distancing from about mid-March. We, you know, there is, um, still that fear because 112 confirmed cases live in Hanoi. So whenever I go outside, which I can only do for essential purchases, that's groceries, visiting a pharmacy or getting gasoline, uh, I must wear a mask. I must have my temperature taken before I enter any premises. And if I'm going to the pharmacy, I must leave my, my phone number so that I can be contacted if, if someone else in that shop is also positive. Yeah. People are very aware of where the hotspots are because um, every person who is positive is uh, published, their nationality, their gender, uh, what their movements were in the past few weeks or days before they became tested for positive. So people can actually uh, identify if they are potentially in danger. So we, we have quite a strong testing system. So 206,000 people have been tested. Um, I think that it really made a difference to me, social distancing, because I no longer go outside my apartment. Um, if I do, I must take all the measures. Um, I can't really exercise without being asked to go inside by the police. But for me, it's not the impact that it's having on our clients. So at present, 50% of Vietnam's 
uh, clients through the whole journey project are human trafficking survivors. And they are the most vulnerable, not just to losing their job, not just to feeling isolated when they're practicing social distancing. They don't have access all the time to good accommodation for a lockdown. They've lost their jobs and they've really, um, they've really had their, their fears triggered. And, and so we find that we are being asked to do a lot of counselling. Um, we've had to do a lot of food support as well. And, and it's really about giving them skills to deal with this added, added stress. Mm, and, and, um, and that's very consistent with uh, what Shreina is seeing in Cambodia as well. Um, Andrew, I'll pass to you now to um, share with our wonderful supporters about Afghanistan's context. Um, and so. Thanks, Anna. Yes, so Afghanistan's, of course, a, a different situation again. Uh, currently has a bit over a thousand cases, uh, 36 deaths, uh, and it's actually in 30 of the 34 provinces, so quite uh, widespread. And all of those provinces, in, including Kabul, are in different stages of lockdown and restrictions. But the really, I think, key factor with Afghanistan is Iran, uh, a neighbouring country, uh, with 83,000 cases. Um, and there's been a uh, quite a spillover of people coming over the border. I think if we all see the news, you wouldn't necessarily think of Afghanistan as a country you'd go to for safety. Uh, but actually in this case, people uh, from Iran have been flooding the border and coming across uh, the country uh, because of the situation of COVID-19 uh, there. So that's a real uh, important factor in our context there, especially uh, given like some of the other countries we work in, the health system is very weak. So to be flooded in a country like Afghanistan is, is particularly difficult. Uh, the other important thing with Afghanistan is it's in a fragile situation politically, uh, even before COVID-19. Uh, the, the US Taliban peace deal uh, has commenced. Um, so there's been a work on releasing prisoners uh, on both sides uh, of, of the political divide there. Um, and also there was an election last September and the new government has only just been appointed. So you've got a new government, uh, you've got you know, exchange of people under a peace deal in a, in a pretty fragile environment. So uh, for our operations there, it's, it's quite a complex situation. Um, like we heard from Cambodia and Vietnam, it's affecting um, clients, you know, how they feel emotionally because they're already uh, have gone through a lot of trauma trauma and stress, uh, and they're in quite a um, politically complex um, situation. But then with the added pressure of COVID-19, uh, they've got added restrictions and stress, which we're really seeing sort of play out on each of them. And also uh, for our adult clients, there's that same issue of um, uh, employment um, options uh, disappearing at the same time. So a lot to manage within that particular context. Absolutely. And Carol, you've already uh, touched on this so well um, when sharing about Vietnam uh, and the fact that there in Vietnam there's been a real increase in the demand for your counselling services. Um, mm -hmm. And so can you just kind of share with our wonderful supporters just around um, how Hagar is adapting its services um, so that we can continue to provide them but at this exceptionally vulnerable time? Absolutely. I mean, this is an unprecedented uh, global situation that we all find ourselves in. Um, Hagar's whole journey project is maintaining at present all of its client services, but as, as we've all spoken about, we've had to amend our approach. So mm -hmm. everybody has the right to safe accommodation. So shelters in Afghanistan, for example, are deemed to be an essential service, so that we're maintaining the boys' shelter there. Um, foster care, kinship care, community-based care accommodation continues. We've also uh, made sure that clients across all country programs um, have updated safety plans and that they feel that if they have any need that they can contact Hagar and receive some information about how to prevent COVID-19 or information about what referral services might be needed. It's difficult for us to accompany a client to uh, health services when it's 
are possible. We negotiate with family members or local authorities to accompany them so that they're not alone. We are providing that counselling uh, through remotely, through the telephone and, and online, but we're also providing legal advice and information and legal services as well remotely. Um, we've scaled up and extended our virtual counselling, as I, as I mentioned. But not just for clients, we're also in contact with a lot of ex-clients, some who have contacted us, um, some who we are contacting, just to make sure that they know that if they have that need that we can respond. Uh, we've established Facebook groups in some countries for ex-clients who just want to create a virtual support group. Um, we're providing emergency food assistance as and when needed. Um, we've moved to online mobile payments when clients' costs need to be met. We have continued our 24-7 hotline assistance across all countries. Additionally, we're also investigating new ways to provide technical advice for our partners so that they can respond to their clients. And that's been online as well as new online training modules. So we're doing all of those services that we've done before but amending our model to meet the, the constraints that we're currently experiencing. Absolutely, that's so good, Carolyn. Such a good summary of the fact that, yeah, the, the mission is the same, the way we do it is different, but we're still providing those services. And, what, and one of the things that I just absolutely love about Hagar is, is what you said around contacting ex-clients. You know, we are so an organization, one of the things that makes us so different is that we are not a cookie cutter six week program that we really, really journey and do life with people. And I think the fact that as well as looking after our current clients and checking in on them, the fact that we are establishing um, avenues to connect with our ex clients, make sure they're okay at this time. Um, is very meaningful um, and make sure that our relationship with them continues um, through other vulnerable seasons in their life that they may encounter that are not expected. Um, so just to pass on to you now, Andrew. So we've talked about um, how we're adapting our service provision, um, still continuing, but adapting that. Um, from an international point of view, um, as the international leader, can you just talk about some of the other challenges that Hagar is facing? Um, and how we're adapting accordingly. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, certainly, COVID-19 is an unprecedented global event uh, globally and for Hagar as well. Um, you know, as we've talked about, we have five program officers in developing uh, countries and six support officers. We've really acutely felt the effects of this across our global network. And we've really felt them on two levels. I think you've heard quite a bit about the effect on the programs, um, you know, running shelters, um, doing prevention work in communities, legal support for clients. That's been one area of challenge, which I think you've heard some of uh, what we've been doing there to respond to that and to keep our work going, which is certainly our key aim. Uh, but the other area has been fundraising. Um, we noticed that, you know, obviously around the world, there's been an increased insecurity uh, in terms of people's financial situation. And nearly immediately as COVID-19 hit, we saw an immediate drop in our funding. Um, you know, for instance, some of our donors who are, are retail chains, you know, as their income went down, you know, there was the flow on effect for our supporter base as well. Uh, some of our government donors have had to pivot their funding um, to put more funding towards uh, health services. So that's seen an effect on some of our funding. So really for us, the two key challenges being the, uh, the, the programming and the funding. Um, so what we've had to do is, as a global network, develop a plan uh, for at least this initial nine month period. And our real goal is to maintain our services to those 35,000 direct and indirect clients that we plan to serve uh, this year. Because we actually have a duty of care to these people because of the trauma and the situation they've been through. And to do this, we've got um, four sort of streams of work and, and task forces working on this. So one is the piece on continuing our adapted operations. So we want to continue operations, but we do need to adapt around the restrictions. So that's a key piece of work we're working on. Uh, secondly, because this is a, a global uh, pandemic, uh, we're also handling our fundraising in a global uh, manner. So we've launched our first ever global appeal. Um, so that's a, a really important thing for us to bring in the funding to ensure that we can continue those operations. 
Uh, the third element is like most organizations, we've had to look at uh, cost controls and tighten up anywhere in the business where we can save, uh, save costs so that we can continue to serve as many clients as possible. And then the last element, and I think this is a really interesting one for Hagar, you know, of course our core business is this transformation of people's lives who have uh, gone through trauma. Um, so we have all these materials on self uh, care and how to help people through crisis. So um, we're really wanting to make um, wide use of those during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so of course, um, supporting our clients and our staff, but also our supporters and the general public. And uh, if you haven't seen as a little plug on social media, media, we're starting to release a series of videos and materials on how you as an individual uh, can help sort of um, deal with the uh, COVID-19 uh, experience because, you know, we've got lots of tools and things we use with our clients, which are really relevant now. So uh, there's some of the problems and also some of the solutions we're working on at the moment. Thanks. Anna. Yeah, and a very brief three minute answer. And so and, uh, we totally acknowledge that, um, that we have really skimmed over service provision, how we're adapting our services and our long term strategy. So you, if you have any particular questions about these things, I really encourage you again, um, as we're wrapping up the formal part of the session to put those questions about anything that these three colleagues of mine have said um, in that question section so we can get back to you if you're particularly interested in any of those things. Um, just to finalise, uh, to, to do the final lap, uh, before we open up the floor for questions, um, I wondered if you could each share a story about a client uh, from the offices that you represent um, about of someone who has been impacted by COVID and what uh, Hagar has been able to do to assist them at this time. Uh, Shreina, I wondered if I could start with you in Cambodia. Thank you, Anna, for, for that. And so, um, we have one of our survivors of human trafficking and um, a severe um, violence. Sophia, who had um, been trafficked by her family since she was about four years old. And um, but through Hagar's support, and she had overcome her uh, traumas and she uh, got recovered from trauma and uh, got education and skills and job. So she graduated as um, uh, from a uh, bachelor degree as a social worker, and she is um, working uh, as a social worker in one of the organizations here in Phnom Penh, uh, helping the girls who have been similar background as her. And so uh, she loves advocate for other people. And but due to the COVID nineteen crisis recently, her organization has been cut so many staff, and she was one of those staff. And she lost her job last week. And um, uh, she, uh, she only have one month um, from what she saved before to live for another month, just one month for living. And so currently she is um, uh, trying to uh, look for another job. So she has been applying so many jobs at the moment and um, uh, asking for me to be her reference, yes. I'm happy to do so and Heka is there walking alongside her. And so Heka Economic Empowerment is helping her to, uh, to connect to partners and to look to find a job for her. And she's really have a hope for her future. She doesn't um, uh, feel discouraged, but having difficulty, but she has courage to continue her life. So um, uh, while looking for a job um, uh, to give her uh, some income to live, to survive, she uh, working as the uh, food delivery during this COVID-19, but that um, wasn't have much, that's not have much for her. And so um, uh, uh, the fund relief from Hega uh, is uh, helping her to, um, to free herself from this time um, until she get a job. And so um, she is willing to volunteer uh, for Hagar, uh, being a mentor of other survivors, also uh, helping some of the uh, Hagar's works here in the office while she is looking for a job. So she doesn't, um, uh, she doesn't want herself to be free doing nothing, but uh, to do something for the people. So now she's living independently. She doesn't have any relative families that she can connect to. She only have Hagar as her family and her dog. She only live with her dog. And um, Hagar is her um, second family. So um, 
yeah, um, we are working uh, with her, uh, 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 helping her looking for a job right now. Mm, and she's a beautiful woman. I had the pleasure of meeting her in December uh, with a real call cool over her life. You know, again, a wonderful example of how guys impact on her life. She's a trained social worker. She's in a hard yeah. season right now, uh, but she still has a goal and her dream for her life. And it's just the season that we, we need to help and support her again, uh, because we are a family, very much so. Uh, Carol, can I pass over to you um, a story of a client that you and your team have been able to help in Vietnam? Certainly. Um, just like Tian is, is a, an inspiration for me and, and for many of the staff at Hager, um, so is On, who was a client for six years. I should say that both Tian and On are not their real names. We've changed them because we don't want them to be identified. So On was referred to Hagar by the government in 2012. She was severely disabled physically and was rejected by the family and received a lot of discrimination from uh, her, her peers, from the neighbors of her family and from the general community. When she came into Hagar's program, she, like many, she was full of despair. She had no hopes. She saw no future. Over those six years, she was provided not just with the range of multi-sectoral services that we provide, but she was also provided a lot of mentoring. She was provided with vocational training. Um, and after six years, she had the confidence and the skills to go and get a small job and then eventually become promoted and, and became um, quite high up in the hospitality industry. Of course, COVID came along and uh, she lost her job very quickly, but she also had the disadvantage of being close contact with someone who was a COVID positive person. So she was swooped up by the government and taken into quarantine with everyone else. And, and living in that social isolation and being removed from her social relationships really triggered her fears again. She felt very alone, um, it was an unfamiliar environment and she, she was very, very much full of despair. She also didn't have good information and was panicking about the disease and whether she was going to be a COVID-19 positive person. And, and, and her thoughts became very, very dark. She lost her appetite. She socially isolated herself even within the small world she was living. And, and with no economic support, she couldn't see a future after quarantine. So. I'm so proud of the fact that she rang Hagar and asked for help. That was her first thing that came to her mind. In her own words, she said, no word can describe my happiness when she first spoke to the case manager and, and shared her panic and her concerns. So we have continued to provide her after her quarantine experience with counseling, which started from the day that she rang us um, right through to yesterday. Um, and on onwards, she has asked for some career um, assistance and economic empowerment assistance after the COVID-19. Of course, no one can look for a job because everybody is sitting in their own house if they have one. Um, she's been provided with prevention information. So she understands what COVID is. She understands how to protect herself. And, and she's starting to use... Um, her social relationships mobile by mobile to, to repair them and build them. And, and she knows that underneath, she's always got people around her. Um, so, you know, On is much, much calmer. And uh, she, she is a client of ours again, but it will only be for a short time until she puts herself into that position when she can continue to live her life independently which is what she likes. And, and of course, everybody does. Um, and to make good life choices. So over you're to on you. Mute. Anna, you're on mute. Ah. Oh. Some temporary um, sound issues. Uh, so, but aren't those two stories just so beautiful, just beautiful examples of the fact that Hagar is a family, that we walk through seasons with people in the long term. What I'll do is I'm just conscious of time. 
So I'm going to ask Andrew to park his story um, from Afghanistan for his closing message to you all. And I'm going to open up the floor for questions. Um, I have had the first question come through, and it's actually for you, Andrew. It's from Patrick in Australia. And he has asked you um, just for some more information about that figure of 35,000 people that we're working with this year. Can you kind of give a bit more description about what that represents? Yep, thanks Anna and uh, thanks uh, Patrick, you're online there somewhere. Um, yeah, so, so for Hagar, we work with um, several groups of people um, and we first of all divide them into direct beneficiaries and indirect uh, beneficiaries. Um, so of that group of direct beneficiaries, that includes um, over a thousand people who we work with on direct client casework where they have a caseworker and they work through all those services uh, like Srina explained so well. Uh, then we have a, so that's the first thousand. Then we have another group of about 9,000 people who we also work with very directly. That can be uh, family members, um, it can be uh, foster families, uh, it could be um, uh, also partner organisations where we're building capacity. Um, so there's another group of direct people um, who we're supporting. Uh, so we've got 1,000 plus 9,000, giving us 10,000. Then there's a further group of about 25,000, a bigger group of people we work with, particularly on activities around prevention. So community members who are hel uh, helping to understand the risks of, of trafficking and slavery and how to avoid it. Uh, also people who are impacted by some of the policy changes we work on. So we have it all uh, very carefully uh, detailed and tracked by our monitoring and evaluation team um, so that we can hit those targets each year. Um, and uh, um, Andrew, you, on it. Thanks. you temporarily cut out while you were describing the 9,000 section of the, of the equation. Can you just summarise that again quickly? Yeah, no worries. Um, so the 9,000, and we could always speak to Patrick uh, directly if we need to, uh, is about um, people who we also work with directly in terms of uh, families who we're supporting on these issues, partner organisations, uh, other uh, clients we're working with on economic development um, activities only. So it's, it's people in addition to those um, clients who are in that first group. Thanks, Anna. Wonderful. And now, second question I'll um, ask you to answer it, Shreina, um, is from a woman called Sonia. She has asked, what, um, what is one of the biggest struggles for survivors once they are reintegrated back into their communities? Thank you, Sundia, for your questions. Uh, I'd like to answer what uh, we are uh, experiencing working with the clients here after the reintegration struggling. So um, in Cambodia, uh, the biggest stigma is uh, there's still a stigma in the community that they are living, even though their organization, HECA, and also other organizations have been doing uh, uh, community awareness training to the community regarding um, uh, all of um, uh, uh, stigmas or uh, um, violence or trafficking, any abuse. But uh, in the this is uh, taking time. So uh, once the client reintegrated back to their community, there's still uh, some of the stigma around. So uh, for example, uh, in Cambodia culture, women have to stay virgin um, uh, uh, purely before marriage. But girls who have been abused, sexually abused, or sex trafficking, that really uh, affect to her future. So uh, more or less, it's still a stigma uh, in the community around uh, the rumors, and also uh, that is a, a, a big thing for clients to face with the uh, community. So, um, and another thing is about economic um, demand of um, uh, poverty, and so. Um, for children who are going back to reintegrated back to family, um, the, in, the poverty, the economic of the family, it in somehow uh, it's really um, a demand for the client to uh, 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 skip, you know, to to skip off their job or no uh, uh, education and uh, try to work for their families. So it, this is the uh, risk of the migration as well, because uh, there's still a limitation of having a job in the country. But uh, for example, in Thailand, it's a, a, a big market for Cambodian uh, uh, family to travel there. And so uh, this is uh, the uh, challenges that uh, some of the children may follow their family, uh, migrate to other countries. 
and then uh, they don't have a good opportunity um, to study there and uh, they will end up with working with families. So that is why HECA is still working and follow up after reintegration with not uh, closing the, the case there. We, we keep follow up case managers, uh, uh, counselors, working with the family and plan with the partners uh, organization and also local authority there to ensure that the client is safe and uh, uh, can live independent after two years of reintegration then the assessment will take in place and to see if the client is ready to um, stay independent then we call we close the case yeah and well, uh, during that time as a hotline we have hotline that the client can call us anytime yeah. I have another question which I will um, ask any of you to respond to because I think you each might have an opinion but I'll let, yeah, let you decide who's going to answer it. It's around migrant workers. Uh, it's a, a question from Trisha Stryker um, and I'm going to read that out. Um, I would like to know how, current situa how the current situation is affecting migrant workers, particularly those who do not qualify for rights privileges given, the, given to citizens of the country. How does Hagar manage to take care of vulnerable people who are sometimes called stateless? Like, do you have contact with them? Is there someone who would be best placed to answer that? Carol, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, I could start. So this, this is a really big issue globally, um, undocumented illegal migrants. Um, workers. We haven't had a large number of requests from them, but it's something that we have brought to the Vietnam government's attention along with our colleagues and other agencies looking at social development issues um, because we know that there are many undocumented persons living and working in, in Vietnam who have lost their jobs. Um, we also know that uh, the Vietnam government has given a lot of assistance uh, to say Cambodian migrants, Lao Chinese migrants to return home. Um, how safe their journey is, we don't know because we can't get to the borders, we can't get to those exit points. Um, but I think this is an issue that we need to address. We do receive some calls from them, but our mandate is, is that we're not really able to provide them with the long-term assistance um, we have to try and put them into the system. We would refer them to some of the UN agencies that deal with migration um, as and as when they arrive as cases to, to us. Right. Um, I have a question which I'll direct to you, Andrew. It's from uh, Harvey Collins, um, and it's quite specific. He asks, has your support from the Australian government been affected? Yep, uh, thanks, Harvey, for that question. Um, Yes, it actually has been. Um, we had one project which we were due to have confirmed, I think it was last month, uh, and because of the um, sort of um, need of the Australian government uh, to pivot on that uh, funding source, they decided to postpone that uh, funding until an indefinite time later in the year. So that's perhaps one concrete example of some funding we're expecting from the Australian government, uh, which is now delayed for an indefinite period. And we've seen similar things in the other countries we work in as well. So yeah, we're definitely starting to see that at the moment. Mm. Um, and so I will pass over to you now, Andrew, to share that story from Afghanistan. Uh, and also to make a closing, uh, send a closing message to all of our supporters from the international point of view. Great. Okay. Um, great. Um, yeah, so the story I was going to uh, share, so thanks, Anna, for managing the time so well, um, but glad I've got a chance to share this um, last story. Uh, it's actually from Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan was a country we didn't hear a sort of concrete story from, and it's from, I think, one of our really important projects called Forgotten No More, uh, which is actually a, a project aimed specifically at boys. Uh, sometimes you don't think of young boys as necessarily the group who is subject to trafficking and slavery, but uh, particularly in Afghanistan, that is the 
key group uh, for trafficking. So we run a shelter for boys aged seven to 18 years old. And these are boys who have gone through significant, I would say horrific trauma, uh, being trafficked, uh, abused. And when they get to our center, this is the first safe place they've got to in a long time after a lot of things happening in their life. So we've got this group of boys in this uh, shelter and then, you know, and they're in this safe place and their life is getting back on track through all the services that uh, Srina and Carol have mentioned. And then COVID-19 comes along. Um, so what we've seen, as we mentioned in Afghanistan is, um, you know, there's restrictions like we have in other countries, but when you're a boy who's in a shelter and you can't suddenly go to school and you can't participate in recreation and you've gone through trauma, you know, that's a really big thing. I think we all know, you know, boys need activities. I've got three young boys myself, you know, being cooped up is a challenge, but particularly if you've gone through significant trauma like these particular boys. So, you know, one story is of a, a boy, uh, Amid, who in the last couple of months has just been constantly uh, breaking down in tears because of the effect of COVID-19, because, you know, he'd gone through this trauma, he'd come to this safe place, and then suddenly the uh, uncertainty, the restrictions has just really, you know, sort of caved in on him. He's showing real signs of uh, stress, of anger. And, you know, we're really seeing that it's slowing down that healing process, which was really nicely underway until this came along. So we've had to really adapt our activities in a place like Afghanistan and that program. You know, we've had to move the, the children can get schooling online. And I know lots of us are doing schooling online, but well, let me to set that up in Afghanistan is a little bit more complex than Australia or New Zealand or somewhere. Um, also, because of this um, recurring stress and, and the pressure on these boys, our counsellors have been working around the clock to provide more support. You know, our counsellors have said they've never worked harder than they are at the moment because of the stress on these children. Um, so it's basically been a much increased um, level of support we've had to give. Um, but we're really confident that with this good support, you know, Hagar's been doing this for 26 years now, that even with COVID-19, you know, as we we adapt, we can still really help kids like Ahmed on their journey to healing, even with uh, the effects of COVID-19. Absolutely. And so uh, I have had a message come through from my colleagues saying that we've had a, a surge of questions come through, which is absolutely awesome. Uh, so please just know that if we haven't managed to answer your questions today, we have taken a note of them. And uh, the country officers from the country where you reside will get in touch with you personally with the answers. So you haven't been forgotten. Uh, we will be in touch um, after this. I just wanted to say at, at the conclusion of our first webinar, thank you so very much for coming along. Thank you very much for coming and, and for engaging engaging in this conversation, for connecting directly with our work uh, specifically, but also thank you so very much for the support uh, that you offer Hager. You know, um, uh, we couldn't, Shreina and Carol um, and Christiana, you know, their teams in these countries, they could not do the work that they do, the work that you've heard about, if it wasn't for generous supporters um, such as yourselves, uh, showing engagement and interest and donating um, to help this work happen. And so really it is a collective work. It is work that we do together um, and everybody does their bit and we can transform lives together. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, we appreciate it and have a great evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Stay safe.